Anybody that was wanting to sing happy birthday, don't worry, we will do it this afternoon, just not during the service. <laughs> so the sermon is going to be based on the passage that Andrew read, Revelation 2, 1 to 7. And from it, we will know and that we need to remember, we need to repent, and we need to return. So remember. Repent and return. Remember, repent and return. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So this first letter then is directed by the, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. In it, the church is praised because it's orthodox, but it's scolded for its failure to love and challenged to repent and return to its original high ground. And it's appropriate that the first letter should go to Ephesus. After all, it was the most important city in Asia. It was situated at the mouth of the Caister River on a gulf of the Aegean Sea, and it flourished as an important commercial and export centre for Asia. The traveller from Rome landing at Ephesus would proceed up a magnificent avenue, 35 feet wide, lined with columns that led from the harbour to the centre of the city. And by New Testament times, it had grown to more than a quarter of a million people. Its commercial importance was heightened by the fact but there were three great trade routes that converged on the city. Now, I said it was one of the most important cities in Asia, but it wasn't the capital. Pergamon was the capital, but it was a city of great political importance. It was a free city. It had been granted thus by Rome. Uh, and it also served as an assize city, in which the Roman governor, on a regular schedule, tried important cases and dispense justice. It had a major stadium, a marketplace, and theatre. Temples were built to the emperors Claudius, Adrian, and Severus. The major religious attraction, however, was the Temple of Artemis, or Diana, Latin. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and I'm sure I've talked about this before. <laughs> it was about four times the size of the Parthenon, you know, the one in Athens. It was adorned by the work of many great artists, but it was destroyed in 356 BC by a fire, but then rebuilt. And it, it was 425 feet long and 220 feet wide and 60 feet high. And there were 127 pillars of Parian marble, 36 of them overlaid with gold and jewels. Christians came to Ephesus, perhaps with Aquila and Priscilla, about AD 52, when Paul left them there en route from Corinth to Antioch. On Paul's next missionary journey, he remained in Ephesus for more than two years. And sometime later, Timothy also ministered there. But it was the Apostle John who is most closely associated with the city. So it's in the context of this city of Ephesus not unlike in many ways our own city of London, that Jesus through the Apostle John writes to the church of Ephesus. Verse 4, firstly, remember your first love. Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken the love you had at first. The first point we should consider is the call to remember our first love. For God. Think back when you first encountered the grace and love of Jesus Christ. It may have been a moment of surrender at a church service, a powerful encounter with God's presence during worship, or a personal revelation of his forgiveness and redemption in your life. Remember the joy and excitement that flooded your heart as you realise the magnitude of his love and the new life he offered you? Now we all know
know, don't we? <laughs> Life has a way of pulling us down and causing us to lose sight of that initial passion. The routines, responsibilities and challenges of everyday life can overshadow our love for God if we're not intending and intentional about remembering. Just as a married couple might reminisce about their wedding day to rekindle their love, take time, why don't you, to recall the moment when God's love was palpable in your life. Reflect on the times when you felt his presence, the answers to prayers that brought you to tears, or the breakthroughs that seemed impossible without his intervention. Remembering your first love involves revisiting the experiences and encounters that deepened your relationship with God. It's about keeping those memories alive and allowing them to stir up your heart once again. When you reflect on the goodness of God and how he has worked in your life, it rekindles the flames of devotion and reminds you of the depth of his love for you. Memory can be a powerful force, can't it, in effecting your return to a more satisfying relationship. Think of the prodigal son in Luke 15. He came to his senses, didn't he? He remembered that his father's hired men had more than enough to eat while he was starving. Think about a person who was once deeply passionate about serving God, but over time became weary and lost their initial zeal. Perhaps they used to spend hours in prayer reading the Bible with excitement and sharing their faith boldly. But as the years passed, their enthusiasm waned and they found themselves going through the motions. One day, as they were clearing out their attic, they stumbled upon an old journal where they poured out their heart to God during their early days of faith. Intrigued, they started reading those pages and were overwhelmed by the intensity of their love for God that was evident in their words. Reading their heartfelt prayers and expressions of love for him reawakened their passion and reminded them of the intimate moments they shared with God. This reflection prompted them to recommit their life and rekindle their first love. Remember. Secondly, Repent. Repent of your misplaced priorities. Revelation 2.5 Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Our second point then emphasises the need for repentance. We know that Jesus said you need to repent of your sins and follow him. We need to continually repent. The church was, was um, commended for their dedication to truth and their resistance against false teachings like the Nicolaitans. But they were rebuked for losing their fervour for Christ. It's possible for us to be engaged in church activities and religious duties while neglecting our intimate relationship with God. I've already mentioned we live in a fast-paced world where there are countless distractions vying for our attention. The pursuit of success, the accumulation of wealth, and the desire for recognition can easily become misplaced priorities if they take precedence over our love for God. We may find ourselves becoming consumed by work or personal ambition, neglecting our time with God and allowing our spiritual life to wither on the vine, so to speak. To repent literally means to think again, to repent, pent from the Greek. Think again, have a change of heart, 
Turn away from our sinful ways. In the case of misplaced priorities, it involves recognising and acknowledging that we have allowed worldly pursuits to overshadow our love for God. It requires deep introspection and evaluation of our lives to identify areas where we have drifted away from Him. Repentance isn't merely a feeling of remorse or guilt. It's a deliberate choice to re realign our lives with God's will and make Him the centre once again. It means making the necessary changes and sacrifices to put God first in all areas of our lives. Perhaps it might involve stepping back from certain commitments or re-evaluating our schedules to create more time for prayer, worship and studying God's word. Think of a person who's been consumed by their career, working long hours and prioritising success above everything else. They've been striving for promotions and accolades, believing that achieving these milestones will bring them fulfilment. But as they evaluate their life, they realise that their passion for God has waned and they no longer feel the same joy and peace they once had. One day they encounter a co-worker who radiates joy and peace despite facing similar work pressures. Intrigued, they strike up a conversation and discover that their co-worker's secret lies in maintaining a vibrant relationship with God. Their co-worker shares about their commitment to prayer, reading the Bible, seeking God's guidance in every decision. Convicted by this encounter, the person realises they've allowed their career to take priority over their love for God. They repent of their misplaced priorities and make a commitment to prioritise their relationship with God even if it means making adjustments to their career goals. So they start setting aside time for prayer, seeking wisdom from God, and seeking his presence amidst their work responsibilities. And as they begin to reprioritize their life, they experience a renewed sense of purpose and fulfillment, knowing that they are aligning themselves with God's desire for their life. Repent. Thirdly then, return. We had remember, repent, now we've got return. Return to your first love. If you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. We need to return to our first love. The Ephesian church was instructed to do the works they did at first indicating a return to the practices and disciplines that fueled their spiritual growth. Similarly, similarly, we are encouraged to engage in activities that draw us closer to God and reignite our passion for Him. Returning to our first love involves taking intentional steps to cultivate our relationship with God. It means going back to the practices and disciplines that nurtured our faith in the early stages regular times of prayer, immersing ourselves in God's word, participating in corporate worship, engaging in acts of love and service, seeking out spiritual mentors or accountability partners who can guide and encourage us. By returning to the practices that once fueled our passion, we open ourselves up to the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. As we set aside time for prayer, we invite God to speak to us, to refresh our spirits and to reveal himself to us in new ways. When we immerse ourselves in his word, we gain wisdom, don't we? Understanding and renewed faith. Engaging in acts of love and service allows us to demonstrate God's love to others and experience the joy that comes from selfless giving. Seeking out mentors and accountability partners can provide us with guidance, encouragement and support as we navigate our journey of faith. 
Returning to our first love is not a one-time event, but an ongoing process. It requires discipline, commitment, and a desire to deepen our relationship with God. It probably will involve stepping out of our comfort zones, letting go of distractions, and making intentional choices to prioritise God in our lives. As we actively pursue a vibrant relationship with Him, our love for God is rekindled and our faith is revitalised. Think of a person who in their youth was known for their love and passion for God. They were actively involved in church, fervently prayed for others, and had a heart for serving those in need. But as the years went by, the busyness of life, career demands, family responsibilities, took a toll on their spiritual life. They found themselves caught up in a cycle of complacency, and a lukewarm faith. One day they attend a retreat where they encounter a young believer who exudes an infectious love for God. Intrigued by their zeal, they strike up a conversation and discover that this young believer is engaged in vibrant worship, serving others selflessly and investing time in prayer and studying the Bible. Inspired by this encounter, the person realises They've allowed their love for God to grow cold. So they make a deliberate effort to return to their first love. They start attending small group gatherings. They join a prayer group. And they intentionally carve out time each day for personal worship and reflection. As they immerse themselves in these practices, their passion for God is rekindled. And they experience a renewed sense of joy and purpose. Remember, repent, return. But what about this last verse? Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Jesus concludes his message to the church in Ephesus with this powerful statement that carries a promise for those who listen and respond to the Spirit's message. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The statement is a call to attentiveness and understanding. It emphasises the importance of truly hearing and understanding the message that the Holy Spirit is conveying to the churches. It goes beyond the physical act of hearing to a deeper level of spiritual perception and discernment. It requires a receptive heart and a willingness to respond to what the Spirit is saying. The phrase, the one who is victorious, highlights the idea of overcoming and enduring in faith speaks of those who remain steadfast in their commitment to Christ, even in the face of trials and challenges. It's a call to persevere and hold fast to the truth, regardless of the circumstances. The promise that follows is significant and filled with profound symbolism. Jesus promises that the one who is victorious will be given the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life, of course, is a powerful biblical symbol associated with eternal life, divine provision and abundant blessings. Genesis speaks of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, that following the sin of Adam and Eve was guarded by a flaming sword in case they eat of its fruit and gain immortality. It's appropriate that at the end of time, the faithful be allowed access to this symbolic source of eternal life. In ap apocalyptic thought, the tree of life exists as a reward for the righteous following judgment. And Proverbs 3 says that the wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. In Revelation 22, the tree of life produces its perennial fruit in the heavenly Jerusalem. The name paradise was originally a Persian word 
for a pleasure garden. In later Judaism, it was used to portray the abode of the righteous dead. The paradise of God in Revelation symbolizes the eschatological state in which God and people are restored to that perfect fellowship which existed before the entrance of sin into the world. Eating of the tree of life signifies the fullness of eternal life in God's presence. It speaks of experiencing the abundant and unending blessings of God, both in this life and in the eternal kingdom. It represents complete communion with God, where every spiritual hunger is satisfied, every longing is fulfilled, and every need is met. There will be no more crying, no more tears. The reference to the paradise of God further emphasises the idea of being in God's presence, enjoying the delights of his kingdom. It speaks of a place of perfect peace, joy and harmony. The promise of eating from the tree of life in the paradise of God paints a vivid picture of the eternal reward and the intimate relationship with God that awaits those who remain faithful and overcome in their faith. And of course, it serves as an encouragement and motivation for us to heed the Spirit's message, to persevere in our faith and to remain faithful to Christ. It reminds us that our earthly journey is not the end, but that there's an eternal reward and a glorious future awaiting those who are victorious in their faith. As we reflect on this promise, it should stir within us a longing for a deeper relationship with God, a desire to press on in faith, and a determination to overcome the challenges and temptations that come our way. It reminds us that our faithfulness and devotion to Christ have eternal significance, and that the ultimate reward is to be in the presence of God, partaking of the tree of life in paradise. This verse is a powerful invitation to listen and understand Spirit's message to the churches. It encourages us to persevere in our faith, promising us the right to eat from the tree of life. And it points to the restoration of eternal life, divine provision, and the abundant blessings that come from being in the presence of God. So as we reflect on the letter to Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, We've been reminded of the importance of remembering, of the importance of repenting, and the importance of returning to our first love for God. Remembering the moments of God's love and grace in our lives stirs up our passion and rekindles the flames of devotion. Repenting of our sin and our misplaced priorities involves acknowledging areas where we have allowed worldly pursuits to overshadow our love for God and make a deliberate choice to realign our lives with his will, we repent. And returning to our first love requires engaging in practices and disciplines that draw us closer to God, reignite our passion and deepen our relationship with him. So may we continually remember the love and grace of God repent of any misplaced priorities and actively pursue a vibrant relationship with him. As we do so, we will experience the restoration of our first love and live lives that honour and glorify our Saviour Jesus. May our hearts burn with a passionate love for God and may our lives be a testimony of his transforming power and unfailing love. May we heed the Spirit's message, remain faithful, and eagerly anticipate the fulfilment of God's promises in our lives. Amen.